All right. Uh, so let's see, as we continue the journey here, so we'll focus on patient access getting live. Uh, we're gonna dive in here now on a next topic of um, testing patient access and some of the capabilities you have in place and some other tools that, that are available at your disposal. This next segment's a bit of a home game for us as we have uh, a couple of, of my favorite colleagues joining right now, uh, Pat O'Donnell and Kyle Brew. So um, Pat will lead us off. Pat O'Donnell is on our strategic sales team at One Up Health where he focuses on helping health plans on their path towards fire adoption and towards regulatory compliance. He's currently focused on helping those health plans with testing and validation programs for their patient access work for that infrastructure and for pre preparing them for uh, the upcoming pair-to-pair -pair regulation. So uh, very topical for all the conversations today. And then following Pat will be Kyle Brew. Kyle's a healthcare technologist with One Up Health, serves as our head of product for health plans. Prior to joining One Up Health, Kyle was at Deloitte Consulting's technology practice, specialized in solution architecture, technology strategy, and data analytics. Worked with a number of, uh, of clients, including the Defense Health Agency and a national health plan with its pair to provider interoperability strategies. So um, thank you guys for, for coming over to the virtual health conference today. Pat, we'll let you go first and, um, and kick us off with some of the patient access testing content. Awesome. Thanks, Nolan. Uh, and it looks like you can all hear me. Um, Kyle, can I get a thumbs up real quick? There we go. We're so that means we're live. Yeah. Uh, like Nolan said, I've been here at One Up Health working with health plans for about the last year. Um, so everywhere since sort of the beginning of this uh, CMS patient access rule and helping them really talk through what these regulations mean, how it's going to affect them, and then what a solution looks like. So now it's it's nice to see sort of the industry get to a point where where I, I've heard this a handful of times today, so I'm just going to say it again. Um, we do have that deadline coming up next week. Uh, so now a lot of our a lot of our uh, sort of interest in the market is starting to skew towards patient access testing. So for the next 45 minutes, Kyle and I will dive into some of that. Um, and there we go. So we have uh, patient access testing, we have third party applications. And then uh, obviously questions, like uh, like a lot of the conversation has gone uh, so far. So encourage everybody who's watching to uh, throw in some convers, throw in some questions. You have you have me, and then Kyle, who's much more technical than me, freely admit that who can uh, answer any of those technical questions you all have. Uh, so like Nolan said, it is a little bit of a home game. Um, we're going to kick off with patient access, but just want to just want to set sort of the standard or set an idea of who, who we are as a company. So in 2017, Ricky, who was nice enough to uh, kick off today's virtual health conference, uh, he really saw, he began to build a uh, fire server because he saw this sort of separation where any of the developers who are looking to innovate on clinical data were unable to, um, or there was a lag time similar to that of the FDA approving a drug. So how do, we, uh, how do we help all these in innovative app developers sort of start to create on top of the healthcare and clinical data that's in the, in the world today? So now you fast forward four years um, now, and we've worked with over 10,000 hospitals and healthcare systems on attesting to meaningful use. And, and like I said, for the last year, now we're helping almost 40, uh, or we're helping 40, plus health plans sort of set up these APIs for patient access, now test those APIs and also look into the future. So what's coming next? Is it, um, is it pair to pair data exchange, which, uh, which comes up at the end of the year? And is it, or is it prior auth, price transparency, things that are coming down the line as well? Um, so we really are, we really are fire. It's all we do. We eat, breathe and Sometimes sleep fire depends on which team you are. Uh, so we're we're well versed in the space and love uh, love helping the plans who are having a little bit of trouble with it sort of get in, get in a uh, good good spot for the upcoming regulations. Um, through the work we've done, we're we've worked 
diligently with a lot of the uh, working groups in the industry. So Karen, Da Vinci, HL7. And what we've seen is through those relationships, we're starting to have more and more conversations about this patient access testing as it becomes the forefront of what a lot of these health plans are thinking of. Pat, we can't see slides, just so you know, if you're trying to share your screen. Well, that is too bad. <laughs> okay, um, here we go. Can you see slides now? Yes, you're good, thanks. Perfect. Um, so, here, I'll just uh, move back one slide real quick. And nope. All right, yeah, while you're doing this, Pat, I'll just, uh, one more thing to chime in and kind of the, the origin. I think it's, it's been, uh, what a difference a year and a couple of months makes. Uh, I've got the, got to speak at last year's uh, inaugural VHC, which was in the wake of hymns getting canceled, the world getting turned a little upside down and all of us thinking we were going to go home for two weeks turned into, I don't know how many months for all of you, but, um, anyway, it's, it's, it's great to kind of get, get this group back together. And I think. Uh, one of the one of the key places we played early on as a company was we really helped connect with the EHRs under the meaningful use mandates, and a lot of those run obviously parallel but preceding these CMS patient access mandate APIs. And so under that meaningful use set of mandates, providers and through them their EHR providers were required to make available a patient's data via Fire APIs. Um, so that the patient could share that data and be really the, the owner and steward of their own data and share them with the apps that they chose to, to trust. And so we connected to, a, uh, at first, a, a few, a handful, a dozen, and now it's thousands of different fire endpoints across Cerner, Epic, ECW, Meditech, et cetera. So that's really where we started back a few years ago was connecting to all of those fire endpoints. Um, there, it was obviously a little bit different, one obvious difference, the clinical data side, but also um, key difference, it was such a consolidated market where there were, you know, a few EHR vendors captured nearly the entire market as, as far as market share. And so this, the payer side, um, coming from a claims data standpoint, coming from a much less consolidated market from where the data is stored today, and, and there's other key differences, but we do have that precedent set by the meaningful use mandates. And that's where we really cut our teeth with fire and saw that, um, like Jeff said in the last session, it really, it is a paper standard and how it gets implemented in practice is never the same <laughs> the way twice, very rarely. We, we saw nuances of the way Epic treats observations versus Cerner. We saw nuances in how people interpret the standards. And so that's really where, where we really got very deep, very fast as far as learning the nuances of fire or what we call kind of dialects of fire or fire-ish data. And I think that's going to become more important as we think about um, all of these payers who are coming at this from all sorts of angles, going live next week, hopefully, maybe some a little later. But as they're going live, I think this testing will help start to level the playing field because I think we really do want apps to have a smooth on-ramp so that they don't need to worry about the custom nuance of of a Humana versus a state Medicaid versus a Cigna versus another health plan. In theory, they're all following the same paper standard. In practice, I think we're going to have a little bit of a adjustment period. And I think that's where really testing is one key place to kind of level that in some ways. So yeah, back, back to you, Pat, but go ahead. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, like, uh, like Kyle said, we've been sort of in this odd state for the last year, and it's pretty clear I still haven't figured out Zoom. So we're something we're working on. Um, but I, I'm sure I'm sure this point's been sort of beaten to death at this point. But as we all know, that July 1st uh, deadline is coming up next week, where plans are really being uh, being enabled to share claims, clinical and encounter data, as well as formulary. Uh, via Fire APIs, you have your provider directory on the same date, 
and then uh, pair to pair data exchange. I mentioned this now because, and I know I know there's a few sessions coming up after this uh, who will speak to this, but a uh, little, little harmless or shameless plug. We do have a solution for pair to pair data exchange. And uh, it's something that we're looking to sort of revel or iterate on as discussions go as discussions go that way in the next six months. So little uh, little nugget to uh, think about there. So without without draining this slide um, and in sort of the spirit of testing, C recently CMS um, released FAQs around testing. And what they basically, essentially what they said was routine testing and monitoring, monitoring of APIs are it's it's going to be required going or it's going to be required and suggested going forward. What there where uh, that guidance sort of stops is is there a uh, recommended approach or recommended app today? And there is not um, in the marketplace. We've seen folks like uh, the Inferno app. We've seen um, Aegis and Touchstone, and then we from our uh, from sort of the working groups and Karen and and um, Karen and CAQH, there's other names of apps being thrown around as, as possibilities there as well. So um, I, all of this a long winded way of saying we are in that field and we're obviously able to uh, facilitate that testing as a third party. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the health plans I talked to today are using their vendor to do testing. They're doing internal testing and when I talk to them about sort of a third party apps point of view, where we'll uh, be able to develop a report and give some feedback into what we're seeing, a lot of them either aren't looking at it that way or aren't looking at that as a possibility. So when you start to have that discussion, you see sort of eyes light up and you start to go down a, a much different path than just, hey, let's have a conversation about connecting. So our testing is live. Obviously, patient access APIs are live today. The provider directory API testing begins 7-1. Uh, and then pair-to-pair -pair data exchange testing begins in October. And that'll uh, that, that's sort of a sliding date as we see where the market evolves. So I, I throw up this slide and anybody who's, uh, anybody who's close with this project is probably rolling their eyes and saying, Pat, we know we know who's being regulated. The the point I really want to make here is obviously these six groups are under CMS. They're uh, being mandated for the patient access piece. But what we're do, or what we're seeing in the market and what we're seeing with um, a lot of the health plans that we work with and talk to is they're not only looking at this in in the scope of CMS and compliance. They're looking at this as let's get our let's either get all of our population on today. So including commercial members and other groups um, or sort of taking a stepwise approach where we'll start with CMS, but I, I think it's a common theme through a lot of the conversations that we've, that have been had today. Fire sort of going, fire is the new standard. Um, it, and why not, we've already built this uh, server. We've already spent this money. Why not really iterate on top of it and make it, make it a meaningful system for our core data sets. Yeah, and I just one thing to add on that, Pat, is just, sure. yeah, totally. And echoing is, is, yeah, there is checking the box. And I think um, most are first and foremost concerned with checking that box for next July, next week, July 1st. Um, it's been a, a anxious period of, of months leading up. And I think that that's a great starting point. But I think to Pat's point, it's, Investing, investing all this time and energy of all these teams and, and the data transformation, the authentication pieces, the developer portal, all, all the pieces that go into this rule, it really, that's really a, a foundation and a starting point for, for some of the organizations that we work with that really do want to use this, leverage this internally for their own benefit. Because yes, July 1, the mandate is a, a member be able of one of these types of health plans be able to share their data with an a third party application of their choice but that's just kind of a starting point there's there's no limit to 
what an organization like a health plan like one of these can do with their own data internally once they have sourced data from claims warehouses or clinical HIEs. We've been getting feeds from NextGen, getting observation feeds for some of our customers and other clinical sources, marrying that with the claims data all in a common fire format as the standard, as Pat's saying. And, and it's that's really where you can start to think of some much more compelling and value adding use cases internally. And so, yes, we, we get, we, we totally get the, the check the box crowd. And I think everyone needs to check the box to, to get started, but CMS, and you, you saw this through Alex Nugi earlier and is really, they, they have a, a much broader vision and this is, we're not done on July 2nd. We're not done next January. It's going to continue to be a journey. And I think um, those that really, uh, embrace that sooner and really kind of jump on board of fire and what can I use fire for internally for my own population use cases, individual use cases beyond just compliance. I think those are the organizations that are really going to thrive in the next few years. And so we, we kind of work across our customer base of payers. We, we are kind of, it's a spectrum. We see both ends of it, but I think um, there'll be kind of the bleeding edge uh, leaders and there'll be the, the fast followers and there'll be the more uh, risk averse, want to make sure a fire is not going to become a, a temporary standard, which it definitely won't be in, in our view. But um, anyway, so I think that's really, we're seeing all sorts of different reactions, but I think we really want to stress that it's compliance is, is a good starting point, but let's also think about fire in, in its kind of truest value adding sense broader than that. And that's some, uh, th that is some good insight, Kyle. Appreciate that. Um, so, like I said, uh, there there's really there's really a handful of apps uh, that I've seen from the conversations that uh, these health plans are looking at for this patient access testing. That being said, our patient app is really facilitating a lot of our testing capabilities. So we, we have sort of two tiers and I'll, I'll walk through them, but you have your baseline compliance testing on this page, and then you have a, uh, a more additional uh, compliance testing that gets a little bit more deep. But um, like I said, the sort of first step here is connection. So when we're, when we're looking, when you're a health plan sort of looking at this, can our can our patient access APIs be accessed by third-party apps? So what we'll do is we'll uh, essentially uh, start to understand where all those endpoints lie, client ID secret, and then be able to come in, connect our app. And our reporting, which I will uh, I'll be able to show you all a, in a couple slides, is basically a red, yellow, green. So can we do it? Uh, did we find some problems and then uh, we weren't able to make that connection and that that sort of concept goes goes through the rest of these as well. Uh, the next piece is we're able to authenticate uh, that the APIs to the both the member and the developer support or and the developer sort of experiences are up to up to scale. So like I said, we've been working with developers for about four years. So we very much understand industry cert, industry standards and best practices. So when we go through sort of these workflows, we'll be able to identify some things that you do really well, identify some things that need some work and be able to provide appropriate feedback on, on those areas. The third piece here is, and Amol mentioned this in the last session, uh, we'll be able to confirm that your fire data is conformant to the implementation guides that are set out. So is the, in like Kyle had just mentioned, is the fire that we're looking at um, compliant with, with those guides? And because fire comes in so many different forms and so many, so much different language is, uh, is the project that has been put into place is, is that where we need it to be or, or are there a few tweaks that need to be made along the way? And then finally, uh, for the baseline piece, implementation of scopes. So if our app says that we're gonna pull, um, that we're gonna pull height and weight from a given health plan, we'll make sure that when we make that API call from 
the uh, from the health plan that we're not pulling something like a lab value. And that when that value comes in and is rendered in our app, that it's something that actually that it's something that was intended and that makes sense. Yeah. So that and that's think, sort of gone, Kyle. Yeah, sorry. I was just gonna say, yeah, I think the, the scopes is a critical piece of all this. And I think there there's obviously the the smart scopes like open ID, um, launch patient, fire user, and really making sure that as part of this payers implementations of this you are need to be very careful that you're implementing scopes the right way so that when an app like like any app that your members choose gets authorized that that app gets a token that is scoped down to the, the minimum necessary so only scoped to that specific patient that authenticated and authorized um, and scoped so that that app could not turn around and use that token to get a separate member's data or someone else's data from from the server system and so a few years ago, ONC had a kind of fire security challenge that um, some of our developers were able to successfully win by hacking other fire servers where we were able to turn around and use a token we got via OAuth to access any data on the server versus the one we were supposed to. So something that we're definitely very cognizant of, and, and I think that's one of the more, um, th this is all kind of, it's patient at a time, but you need to be very careful that these apps are getting a patient at a time and also getting read-only access. Um, you don't want these apps being able to, at least to start, being able to write back to your source of truth record. In the future, maybe that changes. Maybe you have an app that you trust enough to do that. But to start, really, what's required is a read-only snapshot for that one member at a time. And so Scopes is a really important piece. And, and I know that um, Josh Mandel and others in the industry are hard at work as we speak on kind of the next iteration of smart scopes that are going to get even more granular. So today it's things like patient star dot read, condition star dot read, and it's going to become it's going to become more and more like a true RBAC or role based access where it's going to become create, read, update, delete down to that level across resources. And so there's there's some drafts out there. Um, and for those that are involved in, in the Zula for fire chat community, there's, there's a lot of activity going on there. And I think scopes will continue to play a critical part with fire to make sure that we're sharing the information that, that we need to. And that's part of this testing is really making sure to start. Are you supporting scopes effectively limiting to one member and read only? And then there's obviously more and more nuance if you support offline access, launch patient or, or the other scopes as well. Like I said at the kickoff, Kyle's a little bit more technical than me, so I'm glad uh, I'm glad you came along for for the ride on that one. Um, so, moving into sort of the additional uh, compliance testing, the first bucket here is validating. So, um, essentially, and I, I said it I said it a moment ago, but fire fire comes in a lot of different shapes and sizes. So the data that we pull is it we're essentially making sure that it is fire and that if we're looking to pull something like a, like a lab value, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, we're making sure that we're not pulling an entire chart and things like that. Um, the next two are load testing. So essentially when this gets up and running and when we have thousands of patients in some in some cases, hundreds of thousands of patients in some cases start to utilize these APIs. Um, we wanna make sure that uh, we can assess performance over time, make sure that those things will, make sure that, that those things will hold up with uh, additional usage. And then finally, um, it's the monitor piece where uh, essentially a shade of the load testing, but um, uh, applying metrics to what we're seeing to confirm continuous uptimes and performance. In the last two boxes, from, from what I've seen from a lot of the pairs I speak with, is if you chose a solution that was either built in house or a little bit more, um, or a little bit more customized based on your specific needs, I see a lot of those health plans really reaching for the load testing and the uh, in the monitoring of performance, just because they they see value in the additional capability and being able to 
have sort of a third party uh, look at those and provide metrics to them instead of them having to build something. So like I said a little bit earlier, with each, with the baseline and the additional um, testing options, we, we essentially have um, that connection piece. We render data in our app and then we're able to uh, generate a sample report based on our findings. And like I said, red, yellow, green. So you're doing real well. There's some things you need to work on and then uh, sort of a failing grade, if you will. Um, and then obviously any uh, any comments that any comments or things that we find in the process. So there, when it comes to testing, there's a handful of different things that plans need to consider. Um, today, with it being before seven one, in a lot of uh, in a lot of this data is not in production yet. Um, which which environments are we looking at? And are there architectural differences when it comes to the evaluation of that um, of those environments? And then also when it comes to data, we've done some or we're doing some testing in testing environments. We're doing some testing in production environments based on where that plan is in implementation and sort of what they need. Um, I could I can sort of see a world where in the next uh, next two weeks when things are in production, it shifts to um, more holistically. We're we're looking at uh, we're looking at production level data, and then also um, really what what data are we expecting to render in the app, and is there a source to compare this against? And then finally. Um, <laughs> One of one of the things that uh, we talk to a lot of health plans about is, well, we found you because you're one of the handful of apps that seem seem to be offering this. One of the handful of apps that or companies that seem to be offering this service. And then how do we integrate? Um, how do we integrate the One Up Health patient access app into sort of our app directory? And that is uh, that is something we're very open to, and uh, so, something we're looking to uh, do with most most health plans where it makes makes sense. So that's just about my time on uh, patient access testing. Um, if you if you would love to engage with us on the patient access testing piece, my email is obviously right there, nice and short, pat at oneuphealth dot, or oneup.health. And then you can always reach us through the contact us page on our website. And um, we, we can open up the floor to uh, some questions if we have any, Nolan. I think, yeah, let's head over to Kyle's portion. Sure. And if we have time and there's relevant questions, I'll, fly, I'll, I'll grab them. Sounds good. All right, you can go to the next one, Pat. Yeah, so I think Pat is talking about uh, testing it. Um, but I think one of the big questions that we get asked a lot and is just out there is if you build it, who's going to come? Who's going to come use this? And what is the volume going to be? What apps are out there? Like Pat said, there, there's there's a handful that are more more prepared now. And, and hopefully that number of apps grows over the next three to six months. I think there are some apps that are a little bit wary of being uh, the guinea pigs and testing all these endpoints and, and getting into it before they really know who went live on 7.1, is the data quality there? Um, is, are, is there a whole host of people waiting for 9.1 or later have a waiver to wait a little bit? And so hopefully we'll see the, the growing trend of apps uh, who, who will actually be in the hands of your members once you go live. But there are a few I wanna highlight, so you can go to the next slide, Pat. And this is all kind of bridging our session towards the next session, which will be, um, with Anish and, and a few of these apps that I'll highlight briefly, um, and they'll be kind of speaking from the apps perspective more so. And I think we as One of Health, this kind of Pat alluded at the beginning, we're kind of in a unique position where we're both have a patient facing app that is connected to many clinical EHR endpoints. And now uh, we, are, we are one of the first three apps connected to Humana's endpoints, one of the first endpoints live in the industry. And we're connecting to others, helping them test their endpoints as we speak. And so we're both that app but we're also a fire server for dozens of payers as the full end-to-end -end solution for patient access. 
So we really, uh, um, in a way, we're doing our own connectathons um, all the time where we're connecting our app to various environments. We will participate in connectathons from both angles as a server and a client. And that really gives us a, a good perspective of, we really appreciate um, as from a developer standpoint of an app developer, what, what makes a nice experience? Because that really is important that we wanna foster innovation. We wanna foster uh, the ability for different apps to come add value. And if they need to do things, 345, I think is the number I've heard of payers under this rule different ways, that's really a painful thing. And, and some apps just don't have the resources or the time to really do that. And so Karen is one group we've alluded to and been very present throughout um, this BHC. And they just recently um, on June 1st released their kind of app registration guide, which I highly encourage all the payers out there, and it's, it's not just for payers, any audience applicable to this rule, to go out and read this. It's a very nice summary and a PDF um, of where Karen is coming together with its high-level recommendations for this app registration process. Um, and so just kind of some of the highlights, they're definitely pushing having a publicly accessible developer portal um, versus having to email someone or get on the phone or do something. Um, developers are kind of much more inclined towards a self-service model like a developer portal. Um, having good technical and business documentation, I think is key. I think that goes hand in hand with the portal. Having developers not have to ask, what's your token URL? What's your authorized URL? What scopes do you support? Um, where do I get my client in secret? There's a lot of basics that can save a lot of back and forth. If you just have good documentation, what resources do you support? What are the endpoints? Um, and also just business documentation on kind of what what um, lines of business, what what are your different brand names that you want apps to portray? Because not only are apps going to have to render your data, but they do also have to allow members or users of their app to search for your health plan. So there's a lot of good work being put out um, among them by by Jennifer, CEO of One Record Blumenthal, who's working on what do they want to see in a directory of payers. So there's kind of that side of it as well. I think a sandbox is key. Um, having a sandbox with good test data, because I think that the developer app developers really need to know what is it going to be like once I do actually connect and go live. Um, and having the most realistic set of synthetic test data, the better, um, because that really helps them develop the, the best app they can. Um, app registration. So yeah, again, sure, they've gotten the sandbox, they've read the documentation, they've got their credentials. How do they actually register? How do they get vetted? as an optional kind of CMS recommendation for going live. Um, what's the patient experience like? There's some sections there. And then also just general service level expectations. As a payer, um, you should be keeping your metadata statement up to date. You should be um, having support for various issues for developers that they raise. And there should be documentation updates in a timely fashion and just overall uptime. These are all kind of key important parts. So this registration guide is, has a wealth of information um, can't do it justice in a minute, but I think this is a good step forward as a, as a trap for the industry. Go to the next slide, Pat. Yeah, so a little bit just kind of how we've, we we had our onboarding process. We're continuing to, to fine tune and tweak it, and we're definitely taking some of the feedback from Karen's registration guide that we also provided inputs to, to heart and, and updating. But um, how we think about it is, like I said, we have, you know, dozens of payers that we are in implementing the patient access solution for, we really do want to provide a single smooth on-ramp for all of our payers to, to uh, two third-party apps. We, we really do not want, and the apps can't really uh, can't uh, scale to, the, to having to do 30 different security forms, 30 different attestations, answering 30 different sets of questions about everything. Um, so we're putting, using ourselves and our experience in working with these apps in a number of capacities to really do have this single secure kind of informed on-ramp so that we can bet them, we can see that they have a viable app that can connect to our sandbox that we provide. We load our sandbox with Cynthia generated, uh, Karen and US Core and other implementation guide data so that the apps can actually get a feel for what is this flavor of fire gonna look like when they actually connect. And then really just, again, kind of giving them this single on-ramp where we can check do they attest to the care and code of conduct, um, leveraging the ONC model privacy notice and other tools to really assess these apps as far as um, are they apps that are really trusted that your mem that members 
should definitely be encouraged to use. Are they apps that are made available to members, but are less, maybe they don't quite follow all of the best practices and that's a different bucket or are there apps that pose a direct security threat and therefore do not get production access at all. So um, those different buckets of apps, but we're really trying to highlight, to really make this a, a nice seamless experience for these apps to have um, a single throat to choke if anything goes wrong and anything as they're onboarding so that they don't need to worry about the nuances of, of all of these different customers. And I know there's other groups out there like CAQH um, implementing similar things and others that are really kind of have a model, a good model to follow. I think Humana is another one that has a great developer portal and onboarding experience as well. So that's a little kind of how we think about it. But like we said, this is all evolving. And I think the industry is also evolving as, as far as dynamic attestations and other ways of, of doing this. But for now, it's it, we're trying to make it as smooth as we can for the apps that are that are to come in the next few weeks, get it going live. Yeah, and so a little kind of preview, who are these apps? Um, there's the Karen Alliance, um, as, as you would have, might assume, has a, an app gallery. This includes clinical data as well as claims, so not just, not just payer apps, but a more broader set of apps that are out there. Um, we have our own app gallery of apps that we've worked with over the, over the past few years. Um, and I think one of the great places to look as for an idea of who are the apps that might connect, how many are there, um, so there's 68 approved apps for CMS Blue Button 2.0 today. And you can go look, there, there's a link on medicare.gov of who are those 68 apps today. Um, quite a few of them have to do with um, searching for a health plan, but that you do get a feel for, you'll start to see some similar names coming uh, between who is a CMS Blue Button app and who's going to be going live with these, because in many ways, Blue Button is the, the precedent and the standard that CMS um, set themselves by making Medicare fee-for-service data available via Fire, data, Fire APIs and now requiring all these mandated health plans to do the same. So those are a few of the places that you can look for where these apps are going to come from and, and get a sense for how many that are out there. Go ahead, Pat. I think we're... Um, yeah, and so there's a, a few slides here on um, some of these apps. Um, MaxMD is one. Um, you're going to hear from uh, one record and health picture on the next session with the niche. Um, there's also Be Well. Um, Apple Health will be coming at, at some point. And so, number of apps that are um, been very active at the Connectathon space. For any of those that have been attending, you likely have connected with with MaxMD. Um, you've likely connected um, with some of these other apps. And and those are really the kind of early. They're taking the bruises of being a guinea pig and figuring this out. But um, that's that's really the the some of the apps that are out there, uh, as well as the sources I showed in the last slide. So um, before I open up for questions, I'm just going to show a quick quick demo um, to kind of bring this to life a little bit. Um, all right, Pat, I'm going to cut over. All right. So um, this is our test app, and I'm just going to kind of show this is our test app connecting to our sandbox that I just mentioned. So this would be like the app's experience in kind of already kind of being registered with our sandbox, already knows the client ID, knows my the redirect that I'm requesting. And so here um, I'm able to authorize a member. And so in this flow I'm using, um, for this kind of demo plan, I'm using some synthetic patient's info in order to validate. And so as I enter this, I'm authenticating as this um, synthetic member that was Cynthia generated, and on doing this, um, I'm gonna if I if I can uh, successfully enter the info, um, then I'm gonna also associate an email with my information such that I can come back and use this email in future authorizations. And so, entering, I'm just using a temp email. I get a code to my email that I can use to kind of confirm this email is associated with my demographics. And then on doing this, I kind of come to this final, by clicking approve, this is that consent language that you're gonna see where um, you all as payers and app developers just kind of need to make, make your members have a informed decision. So give them all the information they need on should they trust this app and what is this app gonna have access to do? 
and let's say the member does agree to do that, that is where they'll get redirected back to the app that they started with. And so this is our test app, um, pulling in fire resources for that single patient that I just signed in with. And so I can see um, this patient's resources. I can see kind of the patient resource, explanation of benefits. And this is all kind of pulled from Karen generated Cynthia EOBs, coverage. You can see um, other resource types like practitioners that are referenced by those EOBs, um, as well as some clinical data as well. So we've loaded some US core resources um, as well for this patient. And this, each of these, underneath each of these in this test app, you can also get into the actual raw JSON payload. So this is the payload that these apps are going to be consuming. And it's really up to these apps to um, render this in a more appealing way than, than raw fire. I don't think any member or patient ever needs to or wants to see something like this. They don't need to know what fire is or what JSON is or what nested JSON is. They really want um, a way that they can pull in their payer data, pull in their clinical data, pull in any other sources of data into one place and really start to add value. And so this app is obviously pretty bare bones. It's just our test app, but you can start to understand that what are the various data that these apps are going to have access to um, once they've connected? And so this is how what we've populated in our sandbox. We have a few different test patients. This is one of them. But this gives the app the ability to um, understand how does that author authentication and authorization handoff work? How does the OAuth2 token um, retrieval work? And then how does the data look once they do have that token for the member? So this is kind of how we... This is our own test app, but other apps are connecting to our sandbox in order to get that first party view of how this works. So yeah, that with that, I think Nolan, we can uh, open up to any questions. There might be, I know we have only three minutes left. Sorry. Yeah, maybe just, no, no, this is terrific. Maybe just one question, Kyle, is, you know, that, um, that demo environment you just walked us through, who would be using that? Like, who's that intended for? What's the intended audience and the, and like the intended purpose, if you could just state that quickly? Yeah. So, I mean, first and foremost, that with the demo is for developers, um, app developers that are looking to verify their app can, can connect and use the OAuth2 process and model to get data. Um, but we, so that's really the, the intention is a single sandbox that we can let many app developers interact with simultaneously so that they really can build their apps and are confident when they do go live in production that they built their app that can handle the, those processes. Um, the test app I was showing is kind of dual purpose that we can use that. We use that internally. We use that with our, our payer customers. Uh, we use that just to kind of make sure the lights are on and make sure we can connect to ourselves. But um, that sandbox is really for app developers, which we're about to hear from in the next session. Terrific, thank you. Um, there are some some other questions here, but you know we're short on time, and I think you've probably hit on on most of uh, you and Pat hit on most of the topics in the slide. So um, I, I think we're good. Really appreciate you guys, you know, carving some time and walking through this material for us. So uh, thank you very much. We will let you get on with your day, and we'll head on to the next session. Great. Thanks all. Good luck in the next. Awesome. Seven Thanks everybody. Seven one. Thanks.